Welcome, Welcome from Alpha, from Alpha to, Omega. to Omega. Hello and welcome to the 66th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 6th of February 2016 and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. After an unplanned hiatus, the show is back with a bang. This week, I am delighted to welcome Nick Cernicek to the show. Nick and his co-author Alex Williams has recently released a new book with Verso called Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism and a World Without Work. I bought this book as a Christmas present for myself and it didn't disappoint. It's just a book I've been waiting for someone to write. Before we jump into the interview, I have some people to thank. Firstly, the new iTunes reviewers, Mara Walnut, Brennan L, Guer de Gopher, and Goody Wuthrie. Not only great names, but also great reviewers. Secondly, a great big shout out to the new once-off donation of Jake V, the repeat donation of Paul H, and the new monthly subscriber, Christopher W. Muchas gracias. A special mention also goes out to all of the donors and subscribers over the years for generously forking out and keeping the podcast finances in the black. Don't worry people, the low output is a merely a localised phenomenon. I have some more interviews now in the bank and I'm looking forward to getting my hands dirty researching some new guests. Now, before we talk to Nick, I'd just like to point out that in the interview we cover the first half of the book which takes a critical look at the functioning of the political left today and also an in-depth look into the history, strategy and tactics of the neoliberals as a counterpoint. I hope to have Nick Cernicek back on the show in the near future to discuss the second half of the book which is much less critique and much more what is to be done. Us lefties need to get beyond critique and that includes this show as well. So, to the interview. So Nick, you've just recently released a new book called Inventing the Future. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, Yeah, so this book is um, a sort of attempt to be a manifesto for uh, a 21st century left. And it's broadly speaking broken up into two sort of parts. So the first half of the book is a critical analysis of how the left has sort of operated over the past 20, 25 years. And then the second half of the book is a sort of alternative trying to suggest, well, what should and could be done uh, and trying to build it off of exactly what's going on within capitalism today. So trying to build it off of existing tendencies uh, rather than being some sort of abstract project. So there's a kind of a contradiction there in, in that we do need uh, our abstract theorizing to come up with correct strategies and tactics, but we do have to make them relevant to the current you know, situation of capitalism. How, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, this is the sort of, going back to, to Marx, he's often seen as being critical of utopias. This is a common sort of refrain around his work. Uh, and then the more sort of common sense idea as well that he doesn't actually talk about what communism would mean in practice uh, or post-capitalism more generally. Uh, and I think that's all wrong, actually. I think when Marx is critiquing utopia, uh, he's critiquing the sort of abstract idea that imagines a sort of perfected world where conflict and struggle has been dispensed with uh, and we've reached this perfect state of harmony. But that sort of utopia doesn't have any actual grounding in the real world and the processes that are ongoing today. So this is why he's constantly talking about, well, the need to link it up to the real movement of history rather than being some sort of abstract positive, you know, a fiction writer or something like that. Uh, So I think actually Marx is very much in favor of thinking about the future and sort of thinking about, broadly speaking, utopian ideas. But it just had to be connected to the real world. It had to be something that was actually um, responding to the tendencies that are ongoing. In your in the start of the book, you talk a lot about about folk politics to describe the current trendy left or radical left ideas. What what do you define as folk politics? Yeah, so folk politics was 
for Alex and I, a sort of response to our experiences within various student occupations here in the UK, uh, then also our experiences with Occupy London, uh, and sort of watching the left operate around uh, around the world and sort of seeing what are uh, the limits of all of this. And so folk politics tries to name exactly what those limits are. And a very sort of brief definition of what folk politics means, it's essentially this turn towards immediacy as a solution to the problems of things like global capitalism. So you can sort of see it within spatial immediacy uh, in terms of things like, uh, you know, a hundred mile diet, uh, the idea that democracy has to be inherently local and direct democracy as opposed to anything more abstract. Uh, the idea of local currencies, uh, the idea of local banking, uh, but you also see this in a sort of temporal immediacy as well. So this is the idea that we have to give up on large-scale, strategic, long-term thinking uh, and instead be more focused upon the eruption of, you know, philosophically speaking, an event or something like that. And there's also sort of this primacy of spontaneity. Uh, and often times doesn't get explicitly stated as such, but it's, it's usually implicit within a lot of these people's works where spontaneity is seen as, you know, the revolutionary thing and any sort of attempt to institutionalize is seen as inherently reactionary and conservative. And then I think also in the practices of a lot of activists, you see that it's, it's a reactive sort of movement. It's, it's not an active force. Uh, so what you'll see in the UK, for instance, you'll see the government decide on a new policy and you'll see people reacting against it. Activism starting to mobilize around as a reaction against it. But there's never any sense of how do we connect up various long-term sort of um, strategic goals uh, instead of just constantly reacting. Uh, so this is, again, a sort of short-term immediacy uh, involved within these movements. How, how much of this is a reaction to, say, the experiences of how the Soviet Union and that revolution turned out? Yeah, this is what we try to argue in the book, is that um, you can't see folk politics as being a sort of abstract error uh, you have to look at it in its historical conditions and sort of the, the reasons why it emerged as a popular common sense amongst the radical left. Uh, you have to understand why it's so desirable and um, seductive to people. It, it's not, uh, it can't be sort of casually dismissed as just a, a sort of error of thought. Uh, and so this is why we try to draw out the history in relationship to things like the Soviet Union uh, and things like trade union movements uh, within the 1970s and 80s and onwards. Uh, and basically these sort of hierarchical, classic labor movement organizations had all sorts of problems. Um, they were pretty great if you were a white male, um, semi-skilled worker. Uh, for everybody else, it was a matter of basically, you know, we have to have our revolution first before we can have tackle issues around gender or race or anything like that. Uh, so there's a heavy amount of criticism, uh, uh, correct criticism, made of these movements in the 1970s. And a lot of them reacted against the hierarchies of those organizations by turning towards more horizontal network forms. Uh, and this has become the common sense of the left. This is, you know, if you want to go out and organize uh, to sort of posit something like a hierarchy, uh, you're immediately going to be criticized. In, in practice, what's wrong with the directness of these approaches? The problem in a nutshell uh, is that the sort of correct criticisms made of those organizations and the shift towards new forms of organization, new sorts of tactics and new sorts of practices, they all have their own inherent limits. They're useful as a critique of those sort of old, stodgy organizational forms, but then they bring with themselves new inherent limits. Uh, and this is the problem has become essentially that in some way or another, it's become a dogma to organize according to these ideas, do these sorts of tactics, operate according to these sorts of ideas. And this means that for all the benefits that they can bring, uh, and we try to point that out in the book, is that you know they do have a lot of benefits as well. Uh, they do have limits, and they have imminent limits that you need to take into account. In Occupy London, I was there quite a bit, and you know things had to all go through the General Assembly which would mean you had, I don't know, how many hundred people trying to come up with a policy on, on something. And it only took, you know, three, you know, obstinate people or people trying to wreck the thing to make it, you know, just essentially fall into 
a bit of a farce. It's strange that there wasn't a move to try and, and change these organization structures just there, say, in the Occupy, for example. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this is part of the difficulty is that in a certain sense, it's a matter of calling for new sort of organizational structures. And that's not, that's not an easy task by any means. Uh, and in part, it has to come just out of practice. It can't be sort of theorized abstractly in advance. It has to emerge sort of somewhat organically from the actual movements themselves. But I think sort of naming the problem is useful in terms of pointing out the limits and sort of getting people to basically critically reflect upon their common sense presuppositions about how leftist politics should be done. Uh, and I think that this is, this is what we were trying to do by naming folk politics as such, uh, is to get people to sort of critically reflect on it and sort of start thinking about, you know, articulating exactly what these limits are. Uh, and broadly speaking, the limits are that these sorts of, the focus on immediacy negates the issue of scaling both sort of on a spatial sense, uh, so how do you expand geographically, uh, but also in a temporal sense. So how do you actually institute sort of new changes which are long-lasting rather than being uh, a sort of moment of revolutionary fervor that dies down after two weeks? Are we kind of revisiting problems of 100 years ago? Like I say this because even somebody say like, say somebody that would be, I think, kind of revered amongst say people who would have set up to the occupy movement someone like chomsky like when he talks about say the anarchist or liberal social libertarian socialist ideal they still have representative democracy in that with, with immediate recall that even seems to be too much for the present movement it, yeah i agree it, it's, it's sort of a weird thing where you talk to some people and you talk to them on an, on an individual level and i think most people would be quite in favor of something like representative democracy with the, the right to recall. But then on a sort of collective sense, it never actually gets pushed as something to, to aim for. Uh, and so it becomes a matter of, well, the assembly becoming the form of organization is absolutely necessary. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, in part, our, our critique is a really sort of modest one to just point out that the assembly is very useful for certain things. Uh, so if you're somebody that's never had uh, never felt like you've had a political voice, speaking at the assembly can be a very powerful experience. And that's incredibly useful for a lot of people. But this isn't going to transform all of society. Uh, and you need to sort of recognize, you know, what are the actual limits of it as well. I was wondering if we could contrast, say, how, say, the Occupy movement kind of worked with what happened in, say, for example, Tahrir Square. I mean, the first sort of broad difference is the fact that, well, Occupy sort of named the enemy in terms of inequality, the 1%, uh, but it didn't really have any idea about what to do from there. Now, there's somewhat of a similar problem in, in Egypt, but you can name the problem, uh, Mubarak, and you have a pretty easy solution for, for uh, resolving that problem, which is to have him removed. So that's the sort of difference there is that they had a solution that everybody could sort of get on board with which allows a broad cross-section of society to be united behind that project. Uh, whereas in Occupy, I think, despite a common sort of enemy, it wasn't really uh, a common sort of solution. So that's on a sort of broad level. And then I think on a more sort of tactical level, in Tahrir Square, there was much more emphasis, well, much less emphasis on horizontalism, uh, and particularly the assembly as a sort of form of organization. Uh, and it became a matter of, I mean, both a symbolic spot, but then also a sort of logistical choke point. And then it became uh, a sort of focus of defending not just the actual physical space, uh, but the actual movement itself. It became representative for all of that. Uh, whereas in Occupy, with few exceptions, um, as soon as the cops sort of came around, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot of defense set up. Uh, and a lot of the camps were taken down. In Egypt, they had links to, say, they, they organized or loosely organized a general strike. Yeah, so this is the other aspect, is that they did draw out and make connections with, um, with trade unions and with sort of classic hierarchical organizations in a way that was really useful. And so uh, from what I understand, and I know there's people sort of more versed in the Egyptian revolution than me, uh, but from what I understand... The trade unions, when they sort of stepped in and posed the possibility of a general strike, it was one of the tipping points uh, for the regime. Uh, 
Um, not to say that they were, you know, the primary cause behind his fall, but they were an important part. Uh, and I think in a lot of sort of the Occupy movements in the Western world, uh, there was a real hesitation about interacting with any sort of hierarchical organization. Uh, now, in certain points, it was a matter of, well, you know, the trade unions didn't want to have anything to do with Occupy. Uh, and that was, you know, more of a problem with the trade unions rather than Occupy. But I think there has to be a sort of a collective sense that, you know, you can't just do, you can't solve the problems of society with just one organizational form. And we really need to be thinking about how do these things sort of work together. So personally, when I started really getting interested in politics and I started trying to understanding, you know, say how the global system works, you know, IMF, World Bank, ECB, the Fed, stock exchanges, the trade agreements, all this kind of stuff that it's, you know, it's pretty daunting and baffling. Like for the average person with limited time or maybe not the the interest you know it's a it's a massive barrier to thinking globally what what hopes do we have for this kind of uh, this idea for thinking globally when you know the days of having a single state that produced most of its goods it's it's gone with the high bike yeah i mean there's two sort of aspects of that one is that i think the capacity of people to sort of learn about these complexities is usually underestimated uh one of my favorite sort of examples is always well if somebody gets a disease, uh, suddenly they become experts on that disease and they're reading, you know, medical journals and things like this, trying to, it's true, yeah. trying to figure out exactly what's going on with them. Uh, and I think that sort of latent capacity is always there. It's a matter of sort of um, generating the desire for knowledge and then people have quite a capacity to learn. The other aspect is, well, I think what's sort of lacking today is, is a broad meta narrative about exactly what's going on and how people can sort of situate themselves in terms of history and in terms of, you know, spatially what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, and I think that this is probably one of the, you know, the worst sort of consequences of the postmodern, post-structuralist moment is the death of meta narratives, uh, which have, have in practice meant that the left has given up on them uh, and trying to sort of create new meta narratives. But in actual sort of fact, we do have a meta narrative to the world, which is that capitalism has won, uh, and that if you want to be a functioning sort of society in the world today, you have to become capitalist. Uh, and we have this sort of broad historical trajectory, which is again towards free market capitalism. So that I think you know, there's a meta narrative in practice, and I think the left has to sort of take up again these ideas of giving people some sort of understanding of where they. Uh, exist in the trajectory of history yeah it's quite powerful when you say it like that you know capitalism has won <laughs> you know yeah I, we just got to accept it i mean it's the basic condition of our existence today so yeah you just have to accept it and then build off of that i mean this is the thing like capitalism has happened we can't just turn back the clock you know even you know the last major remaining inverted commas communist power is is china and they're one of the most <laughs> you know capitalist countries nearly in the world at this stage yeah, exactly. It's interesting. I, you you know you mentioned in in the book that there is you know biological or genetic constraints to how we think that we're evolved to to deal on on small scale levels. How, how much of this is do you think responsible for our how, how we're drawn to localism and local food and all these different types of reactions to the market, the global market? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain element to it, but I'm really sort of loath to say. Uh, it's all about genes or biology or anything like that. I think that the social aspects are much more important. That being said, I mean, I, this is where I see the sort of interest in the sort of abstract modeling as a means to sort of expand our cognitive capacities beyond what is naturally given. Uh, and I think this is a matter of sort of recognizing the complexity of the world for what it is without trying to reduce it in a sort of um, I mean, reduction is always necessary, but reduce it in a sort of uh, perverse way rather than a sort of way which is adequate to the material. Is that like a research kind of a project, you, you think? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it how, is. like in, in what way, like in a, like a computer modeling of certain social interactions or what, what are you thinking there? I mean, I have this sort of like dream of basically creating a sort of like economic model based upon Marxist principles, recognizing, you know, again, the sort of limitations of quantifying things, but I think you can sort of quantify uh, 
uh, in the economic world a number of things more or less adequately. Um, but then building it around Marx's principles and making it a collaborative open source sort of project so that people can really work together to try and finesse exactly what these models say. And then to start to think about, well, I mean, again, this is what Marx is trying to do was an imminent critique of capitalism, which pointed out its tendencies and then gave sort of strategic analysis for what could be done on the basis of those tendencies. And I think what we could do today with a sort of model is to analyze those tendencies in an even more sort of precise way. So to give an example, it's so common amongst people amongst, uh, on the left uh, to just say that, you know, something like capitalism is crisis uh, and that capitalism leads to perpetual crises, which is true, but it's true on such a generic level that offers no purchase upon reality. Uh, and this is, I think, where something like economic modeling and a proper knowledge of economics gives you a lot of insight into, okay, where is the crisis going to pop up? What does it mean? What is the likely reaction from different classes? And starting to think about how do you actually maneuver the left within that sort of context. I think we must have been separated at birth because I've been thinking about <laughs> this for a long time. I've interviewed a few people on the podcast um, about kind of complexity theory and economics. Like there's one Steve Keen who does it from a post-Keynesian yeah. approach. And then there's also just people who just do it on a kind of a, a market approach, the econophysicists. But, you know, it just seems like such a, a great thing to, to do you know, agent-based modeling and put Marxist principles into it and see how it would see how it would run. It'd be an amazing thing to see what would actually yeah, exactly. happen. And to inform these models with because there's huge amounts of uh, empirical research out there for you know different tendencies socially within the capitalism. It just seems like such a great research area. Yeah, it seems like a really useful project, and I I don't think it's like the answer to everything, but I think it's something that is sort of absent from the contemporary left. It's completely absent, absent from, from the Marxist left. I feel like if Marx was around, he'd be, he'd be building models. <laughs> Volume two of Capital is essentially, you know, model building. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's an incredibly boring book, but you know, <laughs> but you know, very powerful stuff that he has in there. You know, the results that he comes out of it are pretty amazing. The other thing I was, was thinking of there, I had a guest, uh, Paul Cockshot, on the show. I was talking to him about, say, Goss Plan. And he was saying that, you know, nowadays to do it properly the way that they would have done it if they could have, but they didn't have the computers, that to model and plan the global economy is of a similar level of difficulty as Google search. I was quite taken aback with that because that doesn't strike me as the most difficult problem. You know, obviously it's not simple, but it's not it's not a nuclear fusion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's a useful distinction to be made between a sort of model which is trying to, say, analyze the capitalist system and, and figure out its trajectories versus a model which is trying to, you know, map out a communist economy and plan it. Well, they're two totally separate ones, but it was still taken aback by that it would be, it would be that simple. Yeah, I mean, I have some hesitations about Cockshot's work just because it does seem to me to tend much, much too much towards a, a sort of very centralized system. And I think that that's sort of problematic. And I think there's also sort of issues around flexibility of the economy uh, that aren't necessarily taken into account. And the sort of, you know, flexibility around consumer preferences, for instance, or flexibility for innovation, uh, these sorts of things, I'm not convinced that they're fully accounted for in his, in his sort of project. Yeah, I haven't actually read his project now. I've only interviewed him about some elements of his work. So I don't really, I can't speak on it from position of uh, knowledge or anything it was i just found it interesting that you know a problem that was if we take it as being you know the information or the calculation debate or whatever that was the one of the major critiques of of the soviet experiment by you know the right-wing economists was you know that you couldn't compute all these different pieces of information and that's why you needed the market that you know that that problem is is not the same today as it was then yeah, so I think largely the calculation problem has been pretty much sort of solved, at least in its classical formation. But yeah, again, I, I'm sort of hesitant about the ideas of planning that tend to be associated with it, which are highly centralized. Uh, I think something like, I mean, I find Cybersyn more interesting, the, the Chilean experiment, uh, with a sort of, at least in theory, it was intended to be a sort of decentralized planning, which allowed 
workers to have a say over how the production process was actually carried out. Uh, you had some say from consumers about what was actually being created. And it wasn't just uh, sort of top-down imposition as it was in, in Gauss term. Экономика страны Советов по нашему анализу находилась в кризисном состоянии. И нам нужно было 7 месяцев сидеть ночь просиживать, чтобы придумать такие модели, которые позволили бы народному хозяйству, его отдельным отраслям повысить экономическую эффективность и на этой почве повысить производительность общественного труда, а на этой почве повысить благосостояние людей. Мы дались, все от нас зависящее делали, чтобы для решения этих проблем вести большую экономическую работу. Большую, не подделками заниматься, а большую экономическую работу. So what can we learn from how neoliberal thought became hegemonic? Yeah, I think there's a number of different things that can sort of be learned from the experience. And we sort of, in the book, try to point out that the history of neoliberalism, until fairly recently, has tended to be presented as being something that just sort of spontaneously emerged in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and then took over the world without any real um, struggles or anything. And we try to point out, well, actually, the history of neoliberalism goes back to the 1930s, uh, the 1920s even, and it was a long-term sort of project to build up the institutional ideological framework for neoliberalism to eventually take power. So what we try to point out is basically the neoliberals started off in a sort of similar position to what the left is today, which is that it's a very minor position. It's seen as a sort of obscure thing by the mainstream. The ideas aren't really taken seriously by the mainstream either. Now, the neoliberals sort of thought, well, okay, we want to change this, obviously. Uh, how do we go about doing that? Uh, and what they settled on was uh, a sort of long-term project with the explicit intention from the beginning to sort of work over the course of decades for them to change the common sense of the elites, uh, the elites in particular for them. So what they did was they built up a whole series of institutional networks premised upon the think tank as their primary organizational form. Uh, and they used this to slowly piecemeal over the course of years and years change what elites thought. Uh, so you had sort of think tanks doing big picture thinking uh, around what speculatively a sort of neoliberal future would look like. Uh, you had sort of middle term goals about what could be done over the course of, you know, an electoral cycle. Uh, and then you had sort of short term policy responses to the issues of the day. But each think tank would sort of develop, you know, one of these aspects. And what you had built up over the course of years was a fully fledged worldview about what neoliberalism was, how to get it, what it promised, uh, how it benefited everybody. And this was then sort of filtered out to the elites primarily, but then also a sort of public way as well. So uh, Milton Friedman, for instance, in the 1960s and 70s, going on television and giving sort of popularized versions of neoliberal arguments and trying to persuade people on a, on a common level that, you know, this was in their interests. So this is all sort of prepping the ground for the crisis of the 1970s. And so the crisis hits and the neoliberals had, in, in at least a broad sense, predicted it. So the sort of problems with inflation they had been arguing for years and years that inflation was going to be an inevitable result of Keynesian policies. So when it came along and they had problems with inflation, the neoliberals were in a position to be able to say, listen, we've already been analyzing this problem. We have solutions. We have answers. Follow us and we'll, we'll lead you out of the issues of stagflation. So that's what effectively happened. 
Now, what can the left sort of learn from this? Well, one is thinking long term, thinking strategically, but then also thinking in terms of a sort of organizational ecology. So again, it wasn't a matter of the neoliberals trying to find one particular organization that would lead everybody else in a sort of vanguard manner. There was the Ma Pelerin Society, which was a more sort of distributed um, idea of the vanguard. But they did have all these different organizations would work together, and they had a sort of broad sense that they were trying to collaborate on a project rather than trying to lead some sort of partisan struggle for their own little niche group. So you've got long-term strategy, you've got an organizational ecology, uh, and then you've got an ideology which tries to resonate with people and tries to co-opt people's real imminent desires. Uh, and, you know, when it plays upon the ideas of freedom, well, this is what people really want. Uh, and this is something that I think the left sort of tends to forget. It's very good at criticizing what's wrong with the world today. But then in sort of offering an alternative vision, it usually goes on, you know, sort of hard-nosed moral principles uh, rather than sort of, you know, offering a, a, an alluring vision of the future. So I think playing up that issue of desire and sort of attaching an ideology um, to what people really believe and think um, is another sort of useful lesson to be learned. How much money was thrown at this neoliberal project? I don't know offhand, but this is one of the things that sort of distinguishes the right from the left. Uh, so the left today can't just copy the Mont Pelerin Society and what the neoliberals did precisely because of the issue of resources. So it got its start from a Swedish businessman who heard Hayek and decided, ah, yeah, you know, this sounds really great. I'd love to support this uh, and funded the Mont Pelerin Society to begin with. The left is unlikely to find a sort of businessman who's willing to back them. Maybe we'll get lucky, but uh, it's sort of unlikely. Yeah, I always think we, if we just had one billionaire Marxist. Yeah, it'd be quite nice to have some resources. Can the left simply copy something like the think tank organizational structure or are there problems with it? I think, again, there's a matter of sort of limits to what the think tank can do. Now, the think tank's quite good and quite bad for the same reason, which is it's of necessity sort of separate from the people. Uh, it becomes a sort of elite technocratic sort of institution uh, where people go off to think abstractly about things, usually sort of separate from uh, the whims of everyday life. Now, this is a good thing because it enables sort of long-term strategy. It enables that sort of big picture thinking, which like you do need to step back from the everyday world to, to do that. At the same time, it's a bad thing because it is sort of inherently anti-democratic uh, and inherently um, technocratic as well. So these are sorts of limits to be aware of when you talk about you know the think tank for the left. I think the real, the real sort of solution here is just to say, well, we need think tanks, but they can't be... They can't be the vanguard, for instance, of the left. They have to be something which is contributing and feeding into much broader processes of change. How much of neoliberalism's success was an inevitability? The one thing that Keynesianism doesn't really deal with when it comes to capitalist production is, say, the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. The 70s was also a crisis of low profits. You know, a, a crisis was was bound to essentially fall into the laps of the neoliberals and they appeal to the elites. You know, this seems like a huge advantage to, say, the neoliberal project over anything that the left could hope to happen. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it's much, much easier for the neoliberals than it would be for any sort of equivalent left project. As for whether or not neoliberalism was uh, sort of necessary, I don't think it was. Uh, and the essential sort of reason why is because Neoliberalism wasn't the common sense of the elites, and it had to be a matter of actually educating the ruling elites uh, to get in line with neoliberal ideas, to see that they, it was in their interest to be neoliberal. Uh, so it wasn't a sort of natural thing in that sense. I think you can also, uh, and it'd be fascinating if somebody's done research on this, I, I haven't found anybody who has, but to think of sort of alternative history of the 1970s, uh, and to sort of look at exactly what the problems were, now, they were presented as problems which neoliberalism responded to, but there are, sort of, there are alternative uh, interpretations of what was going on and alternative possible outcomes. Uh, 
Uh, so for, for instance, one thing was the sort of loosening of finance uh, in the late 1960s in the UK, which led to this sort of free-flowing capital that spiked up asset prices, uh, which then, you know, spiked up inflation in the rest of the economy and led to the issues of stagflation. So the problem in that sort of narrative is not trade unions pushing up wages, which is pushing inflation. The problem in that narrative is instead capital being too free, uh, finance being too liberated. Uh, so that sort of narrative would enable an entirely different outcome from the crisis than the neoliberal one. Uh, I think it'd be really interesting to go back and sort of see in the midst of the crisis, how were economists and politicians trying to conceive of the 1970s? Uh, what alternative explanations were being given, what debates were going on. I think right now it's been sort of sedimented into, uh, of course, neoliberalism was the necessary outcome. And I don't think that was actually the case. What have the effects been in the world today then of neoliberal? Like how widespread is it and how much does it drive our current existence? I, I think it's quite a bit. I mean, so when we talk about neoliberalism, it's, it's oftentimes used in a very sort of loose sense. But when we talk about it, it means that as opposed to sort of liberalism, which was all a matter of the state stepping back to allow the free flow of goods, capital, people, um, and allow the market to take over. Uh, with neoliberalism, it's instead a very explicit recognition that the state is absolutely essential to uh, creating markets in the first place. So it's not a passive role for the state, it's very much an active role. And so I think you see this in numerous ways, whether it be um, you know, intellectual property, whether it be the sort of uh, property regimes being built up around uh, ecological commons and things like this. Uh, all of this is sort of you know, an active ma matter of the state trying to turn these things into marketable commodities. Uh, and this is, you know, I think you can see this pretty much everywhere. So one point you made in the book, I found it struck me, I, I never thought of it before, was in the West, when we hear about the history of, say, the Soviet Union and how collectivization caused the death of millions, you know, the privatizations in Ru Russia that were direct neoliberal policy, they killed millions of people. We never think of neoliberalism as, as, as a genocide or anything like that. Yeah, well, I mean, there was quite a concern on our part because that chapter is sort of a bit abstract in the sense of it's focused on a lot of ideas. Uh, and the, the sort of reality of neoliberalism is that it has been a very bloody thing. Uh, and this, we really wanted to sort of emphasize that point because we felt it was a bit too um, focused on ideas at, at the time. But yeah, it has, you know, privatization killed millions of people in the wake of the end of the, uh, the USSR. One of the things that you talk about the strengths of neoliberalism was that it was able to modify its ideas in, in, you know, in light of the conditions on the ground this was one of the, you know, strikingly powerful features of it. The leftist idea always is of one of, you know, this trying to get to this utopian place and not to compromise on our on our vision. How much are we in danger if we tr if we copy that model of perhaps ending up like what happened to the other left revolutions? I sort of take that as the problem of potential reformism, and I sort of think, well, it's not an either or sort of situation where either you have a sort of revolutionary moment or everything else is just, you know, reformism to ameliorate the system. Uh, I think you really need to make a distinction about a number of different possible social transformations. Uh, there is a reformism which is trying to ameliorate the worst excesses of the capitalist system, and their, you know, their goal, whether explicitly or not, is to continue the capitalist system rather than to try and move beyond it. But that being said, I think there's a whole series of other options which are ameliorate some of the worst aspects of capitalism, but at the same time build up the power of the left to do something more. And this is sort of why we think something like the basic income or a reduction in the working week, these are sorts of goals which are reformist in a certain sense that they you know, immediately make people's lives better. But at the same time, they also enable much more political power to be built up. And that's, I think, the really sort of uh, useful aspect of them. There are a number of scholars who have done a whole lot of research on revolutions and the sort of conditions for them. I mean, if you look to political science or if you look to international relations as disciplines, uh, they both do that. And I think, I don't know, the left doesn't really sort of look at them. 
uh, you have the sort of traditional leftist analysis of, of revolutions from you know classic Marxist thinkers, but the sort of more social science stuff never actually gets picked up. Uh, there's some interesting work done as well in social movements theory, which, for instance, I think one of the you know sort of big conclusions to draw from that research is basically that the idea that making things worse will somehow inspire a revolution uh, is completely wrong. There's no sort of empirical support for that idea whatsoever. Uh, if you look at what happens, well, when people sort of get immiserated more and more, they become less politically active and they sort of sink down and get just accept their, their position, uh, you know, the more sort of important aspect is not the level of suffering of people, it's whether or not there's an opportunity to change things. Uh, and so you have to look at the opportunity structures. This whole uh, old idea of sharpening the, what do they say, sharpening the contradictions. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't actually work out. Unless you're ISIS for about two <laughs> yeah. years. Although even then, you know, we'll see, we'll see how long they last. Exactly. <laughs> How come there's not a book like this written? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it not kind of crazy? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a bit surprising. But I think the thing is, the, so, so a lot of the aspects I like about the book, the sort of optimistic take on what could be done, the big picture thinking, the sort of accessibility of it to a popular audience, all of that we get a lot of shit for from the rest of the left. So like, if you want to sort of have be a good, respectable leftist, um, it's much easier to just be critical, write for an academic audience uh, and think about a small problem. One thing I really like about the book is the language you use. I think a lot of the times what passes as leftist intellectual discourse has, has basically gone down a blind alleyway of this kind of academic writing that no one can understand. It seems to kind of fly, the book seems to fly against the mainstream of the academic left. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully, you know, in an ideal world, it'll sort of inspire other people to, to do so, these sorts of things as well. Uh, I think it's necessary to sort of bring, you know, I mean, the, the public discourse is dominated by mainstream people and sort of right-wing populists. And I think we need sort of more proper left-wing populists articulating a really critical position. Uh, it doesn't really exist so much. How much do you think? I I hate asking these questions because I always feel like I'm a, I feel like a conspiracy theorist when I ask them. But how much do you think that the current leftist discourse has been caused by actual kind of infiltration of the left? There's definitely in the UK, um, you know, undercover policing going on constantly. I think their effects are largely at the level of sort of a more tactical level rather than. Uh, a sort of intellectual level. I think the sort of explanation for why the left speaks the way it does today has more to do with sort of material processes. So the sort of death of the left in organizational terms and terms of power has meant that, you know, the only sort of place where the left can hold up is in literary departments and philosophy departments, and that's about it. Uh, so you get a whole bunch of academics who want to do radical things, who go into university and they get channeled in towards these disciplines and they get trained in those disciplines and they can do that stuff very, very well. So we've got, you know, some fantastic critical analysis of culture nowadays, but that means you don't have the training in social science. You don't have the training in economics. Uh, and these, these all take like, you know, skill and time to do properly. You can't just sort of step from doing an English degree to doing economics. Nobody can do that. It's just, it's, it's, 
incredibly difficult to do. Uh, so the left has been sort of holed up in areas where it can flourish with academic language that's sort of unrelated to a lot of other things. It's nearly like a camouflage of types. Yeah, and especially, I mean, if you start looking at um, the sort of shifting structure of funding in, in the UK, and I think in a number of countries, the fact that increasingly to do research, you need to go out and get a grant and convince some, you know, status quo body that you're not going to do anything too radical. Well, of course, you're going to be hiding and obscuring a lot of these ideas increasingly so. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a bit tragic, but uh, yeah, it's a, that's the circumstances. We seem to be in that the first Star Wars kind of a role where the force is weak and the empire is strong. <laughs> yeah. Nick, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters by Sun Ra and his orchestra, and A.S. Fedorenko, director of the Central Economico Mathematical Institute of the USSR Academy of Sciences, accompanied by Dan Beacon's USA 3 Rail. You also heard Charles Bradley crying in the chapel. And you are now listening to Prince Rama with now is the time of emotion. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. Omega.